the report. Oh, thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> All right. So last week we talked about the plagues and we explained um, each plague and how it was a direct um, finger pointing at their little demigods. Right. And so this week we're talking about the Passover. All right. So in chapter 12, um, we start with says, and the Lord spoke unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt. So in 12, this is really a picture of Christ's salvation. Amen. For us, it's it's a picture of um, Christ as the lamb, as the Passover lamb. Amen. So verse two says, this month shall be unto you the beginning of the months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. It shall be the first month of the year to you. So this is like firsts. OK, new beginnings. It's just like our lives in the abundance. You know, um, God said that he comes that we may have life and life more abundantly. So that abundant life for us does not even start until we say yes to the Lord. And you know what, Sister Destiny? We were just talking about these stars in, in Hollywood. Unless they say yes, the money, the stuff, the flash, the glamour, the gold, all of that glitters means nothing if they haven't said yes to the Lord. That's not abundant life. Amen. And that's probably why they can't get it together in, in their households and things like that, because there's no abundant life that they are privy to. They don't have access to it. They don't have a right to it because it's not the the it's not the person who has things and who has stuff and who the rest of the world knows it's the person who says yes to the Lord. Amen. So when we say yes to the Lord, it shall be unto us like the first of months. Amen. It shall be unto us like the beginning. What, what was that show that used to say? This is the beginning of this is the first day of the rest of your life. Amen. That's what happens when we say yes to the Lord. That person that comes to Christ now has the real abundant life. And that's when life begins. Amen. That person that accepts the whole gospel, the full gospel. Amen. And that is the faith in Christ and the cross. Um, it is once you have faith in Christ and the cross and you say yes to the Lord, you say yes, um, that you want him to enter into, you want him to rule your life. You want the Holy Spirit to enter into you and you want to serve him for the rest of your life. Then that Holy Spirit does enter in and take residence and you give the, that Holy Spirit then the authority to work in your life. Amen. Then you bring about the grace of God and the fruits of the spirit. So that's that circle that we want. That's that abundance, amen, in action, amen. And none of that can take place until we say yes to the Lord. The first day of the rest of their li rest of our lives, um, like it says, this month shall be unto you the beginning of months, amen. The very beginning all over again. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel. So God's giving direction here. We want to understand it was not Moses, it was not Aaron who had the authority to say how anything was going to go down, right? They weren't um, giving the people their will. They weren't giving Pharaoh their word or their command. This came from God, amen? They don't have any laws of their own. They have no legal authority of their own, only by the divine grace of God, the divine direction of God, and the command of God himself. Amen. Are they able to speak? And that's why things ended up going well for them. See, when man inserts himself into things, and when I say man, obviously I mean man and woman. When we insert ourselves into things, that's when everything goes awry. When, if Moses and Aaron went and they thought that they were saying, um, um, dictating their own will, that they were given someone else directions, it would have fallen all by the wayside. They would have probably still been in captivity right now. Amen. But when you do things God's way and you understand, hallelujah, that you're just a vessel, you're just a vessel that has been made available for him to use. That's what we want to do is be a vessel for him and say, Lord, use me. Take my hands, take my feet, take my mouth, take my eyes, use them. Amen. We have to do that 
And that way things won't fall apart. Otherwise, they absolutely will. Amen. Amen. In the 10th day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. So we've been through um, Genesis already. We went through Genesis in, in, our, in chronological order. So in back in Genesis, there was a lamb for every individual, right? Now we're seeing here, there's a lamb for every house, okay? A lamb for every house on that... Um, when we talk about the Day of Atonement or Yom Kippur, um, the Great Day of Atonement, there's a lamb for every nation. And now there's a, an, uh, sorry, eventually when the Lord comes back, there's the lamb, or even now when he gave his life, there was a lamb for the world. Amen. So we go from individual to family to nations and then to the world. Amen. So his grace has just grown and grown and grown. And the lamb of which we speak becomes the greatest lamb, the greatest sacrifice ever. And that's the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Amen. Praise God. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of souls, every man according to to his eating shall make you count for the lamb. So every single person, even though there was one lamb for the household, every single person in that household had to be saved. Even um, had to, I'm sorry, had to partake of that lamb. Amen. This speaks to, I'll, I'll talk about that in just a second, but he's saying that if there was a, if there's a household next to you that is, uh, a lamb is too much for them, then you share that. You share that right? It doesn't say if the person next to you is this kind of family, that kind of family, this kind of color, that kind of color, wraps their head this way, wraps their head that way. It doesn't say any of that. It says if there's a neighbor and it's too much for them, then you just share yours with them. You guys are one household at that time. And we've got to remember that because sometimes, not sometimes, all the time, we have so many different different denominations and so many different groups. And it's like if we're serving Christ and we confess Christ as our savior, we're brothers and sisters. Amen. We're brothers and sisters. It doesn't matter. You know, there are some people that um, when we have communion, like we have juice and a little host in here. Right. We have the juice. We have the host. Some people only have water. You know, they only there's some churches that will only take water because they believe that this is um, too close to um, cannibalism, too close to cannibalism to take juice. There are some people that take wine, actual wine. Listen, we let these little differences separate us. These little bitty differences have caused rifts throughout the church of God, the kingdom of God. Amen. So if we're doing that, then how are we going to share the lamb? The lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We're serving the same Christ. We're serving the same sacrificial lamb. So we've got to get out of our heads with this and get into our hearts with what we're supposed to be doing. When we say yes to the Lord, the Lord gives us a new heart. He says he gives us a fleshy heart, not flesh, but a soft heart is what he means by fleshy heart. When we had hard hearts before. So we've got to make sure that we are doing things according to the word and not like we just said, letting man insert man's ideas into things because that's how we've caused a rift. That's how we've caused such a split. Amen. So we're supposed to, they were supposed to share that lamb. All right. But each of them had to eat of that lamb. Just like now, our whole household can be under the Christian flag, so to speak. But unless everybody says yes, then that household's not saved. You can be saved, but the household's not saved unless everyone partakes of the lamb. Everyone says yes to the Lord. Amen. The lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Salvation is just, 
it's so personal. And it's so personal because he intends for us to have that intimacy with him. Amen. Amen. Verse five, your lamb shall be without blemish. Of course, Christ was without blemish. He was perfect. He was perfect in all of his ways. Um, first Peter uh, 1 and 19, it says, who the lamb represented, holy, harmless, undefiled, a lamb without spot. All right. Then it goes on to say a male of the first year, a male of the first year. That means a, a male of the first year is strong, is virile, is um, has mobility, has strength, has all of these things. So this speaks to the, the manhood of Christ. Amen. The manhood of Christ. He did not give his life when he was old and feeble. You know, and it's like, OK, well, I'm not going to do anything at this point, but sit in the rocking chair. So I'll go ahead and give it up now. He didn't do that. He gave his life in his most virile time when he was in the prime of his life. Our men who are on here, remember when you were 33 and a half years old? You know, in your 20s, you, you think you're manly, but you kind of, nah. <laughs> you know, but you think you are. When you're in your 30s and you really come into more maturity and you realize and you may have some have accomplished, you know, some things, it's like, OK, all right, I'm in here now. And that's when Jesus chose to give his life. Imagine giving your life at 33, even the, the women here. Um, I think in my 20s, I did a lot. I really I did a lot in my 20s, but it wasn't until my 30s that I was walking into it and I was I walked into it. I was settled in it. And others um, took me seriously. They realized it wasn't just a fluke that I did all of those things. This was really, you know, I was really as tough as as, <laughs> as I knew I was in my 30s. And so at 33 and a half, to then have to give, not have to, but say, okay, I'm going to, I've done everything that I need to do. I'm going to give my life now. That's what is intended in this this um, part about a male of the first year. It's the virile manliness, amen, the strength that Christ had. And he chose that time to give himself for us. It, amazing. It's just amazing. And it says, you shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. So the goats then did not represent, like now we talk about the goat and it represents the enemy because that's what the satanic circles has taken. The goat um, then, if you think about the billy goat that has the very long beard and looks so regal, right? It's more of that, along of that nature, okay? So you shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats and you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. All right. And you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. So they would have chosen the animal on the 10th day. And then on that 14th day was the day of the sacrifice. And you think about numbers in the word. 10 is the number of testimony, but 14 is the number of deliverance and salvation. Amen. And so even back then, they were... Um, looking ahead they weren't but but God was given a foreshadowing of Christ deliverance and salvation amen and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening now in the original Hebrew it said um shall kill it between the evenings okay or between two evenings I think is is more along what it said and between the two evenings would mean around 3 p.m. And what time did Christ give up the ghost? What time did he say it is finished? Right around 3 p.m. At 3 p.m. Amen. Again, those naysayers who talk about this Bible just being made up and contrived, no way that all of these men over all of those years could have put all of this together. Couldn't have done it. It's just not possible and make it fit and make it make sense. This is amazing what God did with this word and then left it to us. Oh, amazing. Amen. And I'm in verse seven now. And they shall take of the blood um, and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the houses wherein they shall eat it. Okay. Um. 
I'm not going to go too deep into that for the sake of time. All right. Um, again, what we are looking forward to the doorposts is where the, the Passover blood was was placed. But Yom Kippur, that day of the great atonement, it was placed there on the Ark of the Covenant, which is the law. Amen. And then when Christ shed his blood on the cross, that is then placed on us. Amen. And they shall eat uh, eat the flesh in that night. They shall eat the flesh in that night. When we're talking about the flesh, that they shall eat it. They're not talking about, again, cannibalism or anything like that. They're talking about taking it, take Christ. You shall take Christ. You shall ingest everything that he is. The cross, the resurrection, amen, the, the whole gospel. Take the whole gospel and ingest. That's what that means. And unleavened bread, this just is a, a typification of the perfection of Christ, that unleavened bread. All right. And with bitter herbs, they shall eat it. So the salvation, the deliverance, all of that came after the bitter herb. And the bitter herb spoken about here is slavery, that they were enslaved. Amen. So they had to take that bitter herb and not forget about it, not forget about slavery, not forget about those things that they endured, but um, take that and appreciate even more the lamb and appreciate even more deliverance and salvation. Eat not of it raw nor sodden at all with water, but roast it with fire. So this speaks to the cross and the, pi the price that was paid on the cross. His head with his legs and with the pertinence thereof. So the pertinence is talking about the intestines. At that time, what they would do was they would take out the intestines, they would wash them clean, and then they would put them back in and then sacrifice, all right? So it speaks to the, the depth, okay? Like when David talks about in the depths of my reins, the core of who we are, take the full gospel Take it raw, take all of it, eat of it raw. Don't try to fix it up. Don't try to dress it up. Don't try to put gimmicks to it. Don't need all of that. And he says, don't do all of that. Amen. You take it for all that it is and you take it um, to the depths of who you are. Take everything that he has to give. Amen. And again, don't, don't sully it up. And he tells you, you know, even plainer um, later on when he says, do not add or take away from my word. And I think that also has to do with a lot of the things, you know, if you, no one is going to take the, well, I shouldn't say no one, because in this world, we don't know what's going to happen. I was going to say, no one's going to take the Bible and try to write it over or anything like that. We don't even know. I can't anymore. Um, but what we do see is we see a lot of antics in churches. You know, um, we one person does something and then before you know it, we've got several years of foolishness that before it gets really, really old and we have to let it go. I promise you in the 1990s, if I had to touch one person and tell them something one more time, I was going to lose my mind. Touch one person and tell them we're going home in Jesus name. Touch one person, high five them and do a spin and circle. And oh, I'm like, I'm, would you just preach? I just want the word. I'm just trying to learn. Before that, in the 70s and 80s, it took one person to breathe heavy. And I'm sure it was because that person honestly couldn't breathe. And then the next thing you hear is everybody and da, 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 <clears throat> da, 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 da. <clears throat> this person probably could not breathe and was struggling, fighting for life, trying to preach. And now we've got this gimmick, you know, going on. You know, just stop it. Just give the word of God. You know, there's a difference. That's why I can sit here in this seat on the computer and computer and give the word of God because I don't need to sell it up. You know why? Because I know the word. And that's what we all need. I don't need to turn a hand flip and do a cartwheel and give you all a back bend. All right. To tell the word, to preach the word. I can sit right here, feet flat and preach the word. Amen. Unadulterated, raw, not sodden with all the water. Amen. And I don't need to water it down. We don't have to water down the word. We just have to be able to give it, give the word. And when we give the word, we don't have to scare people with only the fire and the brimstone and all that. We just give the word. And when we give the word, people can see, yeah, there are those parts where God's not playing, right? He's not playing about his word, 
but when we see those few verses where he's really hard, that comes after all the love that he shows. Amen. So I don't have to come here, like I said, and, you know, have a, 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 a piece of charcoal on top of my head talking about fire and brimstone. Just give the word for what it is, but not sodden with water. Amen. Praise God. Just give everything and let everyone partake of the cross. Verse 10, and you shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. That means take all of it. You cannot take bits and pieces of his salvation. You cannot take bits and pieces of his word. Take all of it. And that which remains of it until the morning, you shall burn it with fire. So Christ cannot be received at all in stages. You got to take it, take him or nothing at all. Get rid of it. Just get rid of it all if you're not going to take all of him. Um, and thus you shall eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet and your staff on your, your, um, your staff in your hand. So this shows that the people at that time were positioned to leave. They were positioned to exit Egypt. What does that mean for us? We need to be ready or we need to have been ready to exit Egypt. Egypt, all of those things of the world, when you say yes, be ready to exit, be ready to get out of all of it. Don't say, okay, I'm going to say yes to the Lord, but I'm going to still go over here to his house for the night, okay? Or man, I, yeah, I'm going to say yes, but I got a couple over here that I need to, you know, take care of for a little bit, and then I'll say yes for real. Find me a wife and settle down, <laughs> you know? You have to take all of them, all of them. Or nothing at all, because he says later on in his word, what? He doesn't want us to be lukewarm, hot or cold. And that's what this is is, is um, foreshadowing. We're playing with, with Christ. If we say, yep, yeah, I'm going to say yes, but I'm going to do this thing in stages. Salvation is not a 12-step program. Amen? Salvation is salvation, and that's it. Now, yes, we're going to grow up more. We're going to become more disciplined and more determined. But the little things, our reasonable service, we have to be ready to give. Amen. We have to be ready to do uh, the reasonable things. Study to show thyself approved. Say no and walk away to those things of the world that we know are not godly and are not good for us. If we are around people that are going to lead us back to the world. We have to say, you know, goodbye to them for a while. We can pray for them and pray that they say yes too. But we can't go around and, you know, we know that if I'm around this person, he or she's going to lead me to this. And then that's going to, you know, start me on a path back to destruction. We can't do that. We have to take all of it. Not hot, not lukewarm, but hot or cold only. Amen. And be always ready. The word of God tells us, be ye also ready. And that's what he says. With your loins girded, your shoes on your feet and your staff in your hand. That means you're not getting ready to be still when you say less, yes to the Lord. When you say yes to the Lord, you're going somewhere. Amen. You're going somewhere. You will be elevated. Amen. But you have to be ready. And you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. So don't tarry. You don't have time again to take these little bite-sized morsels. Take him and take him in his entirety. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and I will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Pass through can also be um, translated as go through. I will go through. I'm going to go through all of them, all right? When God goes through a thing, there is no tsunami, there is no earthquake, there is no volcano that can touch God's going through, amen? So he said, I'm going to go through it. And, you know, he's warned them over and over and over again. So it's just like, again, when we think of our parents, we can only get warned so much before there's going to be some punishment, Right? He may, they may give us a warning, but I have, I don't know too many parents that go beyond the three strike rule, right? One, two, three strikes, you're out. All right, time's up. That's it. But Christ, God gave 
warning after warning after warning, chance after chance after chance. And he does that all through his word when he says, OK, now enough's enough. I'm going through Egypt. Egypt for us, again, is is equal to the world. I'm going through, I'm tearing this stuff up. I'm tearing it down. And God only lets things last for so long when there are things that are just horrible um, pandemics and epidemics. And I don't mean the illnesses in this world. I mean, like, you know, just think about right now. Uh, think about uh, the different kinds of drugs from decade to decade. There's different kinds of drugs decade to decade that run rampant. This is nothing new. Now we're talking about um, meth and... Um, We'll just stick with that for now. Now we're talking about meth a lot. In the 80s, there was a lot of crack cocaine. Um, 70s, you had heroin. There, there's something every single decade. But when enough's enough, enough's enough. It comes to an end for the most part. You know, there's still the use here and there, but something, it, it comes to an end. So anytime you've got those things, whether it is spiritual, physical, or otherwise, it's only going to last so long before God says enough's enough. I spoke before about the pandemic when I said, look how many churches ended up closing because there was a lot of fluff that was going on and they didn't have a leg to stand on when things opened back up. But the ones that opened back up, I have seen them open back up stronger right? When there was the true word going on and the Holy Spirit was honestly there. But if you got a lot of foolishness going on, they didn't come back or either they're really, really struggling. Amen. Amen. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. So the blood applied to the door post meant that their faith and their trust in the Lord was solid. Amen. And when I see the blood, I will pass over. All right. So this is one. This is probably one of the most. All of the Bible is very, very important. But this is probably one of the most important scriptures. Because the death angel has to pass over when he sees the blood. When we accept Jesus and we've got that blood applied to our lives, the enemy cannot touch us. He cannot touch touches he can try to irritate and annoy and his attempt is to take our lives but all it can do is irritate annoy and and put a little bit of stress out there but he can't he can't take our lives he cannot take our lives amen amen and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when i smite the land of egypt so when the rest of the world goes down we can even talk about um you know going back to um revelation that we're studying on sunday when the rest of the world goes down we're not privy to that praise god amen because we've said yes and we've done it in in, in totality and we've not done it you know when he gave us a second and a third and a fourth chance all the way through the tribulation we've said yes and that's that amen Amen. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial and you shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. So even today we've got Passover. Amen. We've got the Passover feast. Seven days shall you eat unleavened bread. Even the first day you shall put away leaven out of your houses for whosoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, the soul shall be cut off from Israel. That means eternally lost forever, period. No going back. When God speaks, he does not repent of his word and he means exactly what he is saying. And in the first day, there shall be a holy convocation. And in the seventh day, there shall be a holy convocation to you. So all... All of this that was being done um, at this point, the blood being put on the door, coast, door posts and all of this and them accepting the word of God, um, it was holy to him. Holy means set apart. It was holy to him. And again, it's, all of this speaks to Christ. Um, and in the seventh day, there should be a holy convocation unto you. All right. So this is the entirety of the, the entirety of this time period is holy. Not just one day, not just one hour, but this whole time is holy. No manner of work shall be done. So that means, again, so when he's talking about work, yeah, the people should not do any work. 
But for us, it means this is not by our works. Salvation is not by work. It is not by works at all, but it is by the blood of Jesus, is by the grace of God. Amen. And we are, we know we're saved by grace. And you shall observe the feast of the unleavened bread, for in this selfsame day have I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, you shall observe this day in your generations by an ordinance forever. Okay? Everlasting covenant. No two ways about it. Everlasting. In the first month, on the 14th day of the first, I'm sorry, in the first month, on the 14th day of the month at evening, you shall eat unleavened, unleavened bread until the one and 20th day of the month at evening. Seven days shall it shall there be no leaven found in your houses for whosoever eats that which is leaven. Even that soul shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he be a stranger or born in the land. All right. Um, you shall eat nothing leavened. In all your habitations shall you eat unleavened bread. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, draw out and take you a lamb according to your families and kill the Passover. All right, so the elders of Israel were the leaders, right? Those leaders there of Israel. And currently it is those that preach the full gospel, those that preach the gospel of Christ. And you shall take a bunch of hyssop. Hyssop is cleansing, amen? It, it's, it's cleansing. So it says you shall take a, a, a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out at the door of his house until morning. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood upon the lentil and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come into your houses to smite you. And you shall observe this thing for an ordinance to you and to your sons forever. And it shall come to pass when you become to the land which the Lord will give you according as he has promised that you shall keep this service. And it shall come to pass when your children shall say unto you, what do you mean by this service? So we're plainly talking about um, responsibility here. It's responsibility for us to always tell our children about salvation, about the free gift of life about um, what Christ did for us on the cross, amen? We have to keep telling them generation after generation after generation. If we don't, the church will, will not be ready, amen? He said he's coming back for a church without what? Spot or wrinkle, I say it all the time. We will be spotted and very wrinkly if we do not tell our children and their children and their children about the salvation of Christ. Amen. And the gift of, of salvation and the love that he has for us and the blood that he shed for us. That you shall say it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses and people bowed the head and worshiped. And the children of Israel went away and did as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. And it came, I'm in 29 now. And it came to pass that at midnight, the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne unto the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon and all of the firstborn of the cattle. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians. And there was a great cry in Egypt for there was not a house where there was not one dead. And he called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, rise up and get you forth from among my people, both you and the children of Israel and go serve the Lord as you have said. Also take your flocks and your herds as you have said and be gone and bless me also. Remember, gird up your loins, strap on your sandals, get your um, staffs ready. So that means always be ready, always be ready for worship, always be ready to go into it because when the Lord says go, we've got to go. Amen. Again, be it physical or spiritual. When the Lord says go, we have to go. He's not asking us for that. When we say yes to him and we again have that spiritual discipline and he's growing, there are things that are going to take place. 
last week um, we got into a conversation and um, Brother Isaac was sharing, you know, this 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 worship, this gift of worship and this new level of worship that God had given to him. Amen. God did not ask him if he was ready. Amen. Brother Isaac had to be ready. Loins had to be girded. Sandals had to be strapped and the staff had to be in his hand because God said, you said you wanted this. So let's go. Amen. Let's go. And then he opens us up to things that we may not think we're ready for. They may be quite shocking <laughs> when we walk into these things, but we have to be ready. Be ye also ready. Gird up your loins, keep your sandals on, have that staff. Just like he told the, the, um, the disciples, right? When that gate opened, when that jail opened up, they had to have their sandals on and be ready to go because again, another earthquake, when he shook it up and those prison doors opened up, they had to go. They couldn't say, oh, it's open. Let me put on my sandals. Oh, where's my staff? Oh, goodness gracious. Where is this and where is that? No, they needed to be ready. Amen. Needed to be ready. Amen. He says, also take your flocks and your herds, as you have said, and be gone and bless me also. So in the midst of all this, don't stop worshiping. That's what he's saying. Don't stop worshiping. Worship is what? Worship is your weapon in warfare. Amen. And the Egyptians were urgent upon the people that they might send them out of the land in haste, for they said, we all be dead men. So they knew something was happening. And the people took their dough before it was leavened, their kneading troughs um, being bound up in their clothes upon their shoulders. So they were ready to go. And the children of Israel did according to the word of Moses, and they borrowed of the Egyptians jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment. So not only am I leaving from under your tutelage, but I'm taking your stuff too, because God said I could. Amen. He's not sending me without money. He's not sending me without being prepared. Amen. So that's what they did. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. At this point, the Egyptians were like, just go, just go, just get out. So that they lent unto them such things as they required. And they spoiled the Egyptians. All right. So that means they, they left them with nothing. They left them penniless. All right. And by right, they're the ones who did all the work anyway, right? They did all of the work for that which the Egyptians had. All right, um, 37. And the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succoth, about 600,000 on foot who were, um, who were men besides children. So this is about 15 miles they went. Um, and a mixed multitude went up with them and flocks and herds and very much cattle. So this is where we find that there were also, also some Egyptians who went. Now, when we think about slavery in this country, we know that we had um, the Underground Railroad, we had Harriet Tubman, we had others that um, were conductors, as we call them, of the Underground Railroad. And in that, we had some sympathizers, okay? We had abolitionists. And we could not have made it, you know, um, as many that fled could not have made it without these abolitionists as well, because they have to have people on their side to be able to get some rest, to be able to know the next direction to go, to be able to get some sustenance, all of that. This is a hard way to go. So the same thing happened here. There so, were some Egyptians, those people who were the oppressors um, on the whole but who decided that what's happening is not right. And they went with them. It says it here, a mixed multitude went up also with them. All right. And so it says multitude. So there were quite a few of them. In any kind of exodus, any kind of movement, any kind of civil rights fight, this is not something one group can do on their own. We all have to do it together. There's got to be people together. So all this I'm against you. You're against me. We're going to do this this way. That has to go out the window. United we stand, divided we fall. Your fingers will break easily, but a fist is a lot stronger. Amen. Got to have more than just one, more than just one type. Amen. Amen. And flocks and herds, even much cattle. And they baked unleavened cakes of the dough 
which they brought forth out of Egypt, for it was not leavened because they were thrust out of Egypt and could not tarry. Neither had they prepared themselves for any, any uh, victual. Now I'm laughing here because God is funny. I have to bake now bread every day because I have a little bread head in there by the name of Trinity. All right. She can go through a loaf of bread. I've, I've never seen a child be able to go through a loaf of bread. Right. And so I've been making bread every day, the lo a new loaf every day. Last night. I was going through it yesterday. I was, I was all discombobulated yesterday. Last night I or afternoon, because it takes a while for the um, bread to rise. Right. Because once you put the yeast in it, it has to rise. I made a whole rock of bread because I forgot the yeast. I forgot to put the yeast in it. So that was three hours and 10 minutes gone of a loaf of bread and it came out. It was just, a, it could have been used as a weapon, couldn't it? It's the most awful, ridiculous thing I've ever seen. And I should have known because I did not smell it. You know, it's baked bread, when that ba uh, bread gets to that last, um, what, 40 minutes or so, Oh, it smells so good. And I didn't smell it. But again, I'm all discombobulated. So I wasn't even thinking about the fact that I didn't smell it and didn't have the yeast in it. So they couldn't have the yeast. So we had an unleavened rock that we couldn't even eat. But they had that unleavened bread <laughs> because they didn't have time for that yeast to rise. They didn't have time for all of that. They had to get ready to go. So God gave me an example last night of what they had to deal with, <laughs> amen, that they had unleavened bread. They had this hard bread because they had to go. They didn't have time <laughs> for the yeast to rise. That's just amazing, amen, <laughs> just amazing. <laughs> I swear he'll give us an example. Now the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years, all right? Um, so this doesn't necessarily mean it was an actual 430 years, but from the time of Abraham, when he was around 75 years old, all right, then from the time he left um, the Ur of Chaldees, then 430 years, it gets to 430 years from that point. Okay, does that make sense? So from the time... Abraham started because that started that that covenant that was when God made covenant it was 40 the 430 years from that time okay all right so it was about 200 uh, 200 plus years or thereabout that we're talking about that time in Egypt itself okay and it came to pass at the end of the 430 years even the self same day it came to pass that all the hosts of the Lord the Lord I'm sorry went out from the land of Egypt. It is a might to be much observed unto the Lord for bringing them out of the land of Egypt. This is the night of the Lord to be observed by all the children in all children of Israel in their generations. All right, we're gonna get just through 12 today and um, we will pick up next week with 13. I was going to try to get 12 and 13. But again, this, this 12th chapter is so very important. I did not want to skim on that at all. All right. Um, verse 43. And the Lord said unto Moses and Aaron, this is the ordinance of the Passover. There shall be no stranger eat thereof. But every man's servant who is, brought, who is bought for money, when you have circumcised him, then shall he eat thereof. A foreigner and a hired servant shall not eat thereof because they would not have been circumcised. They wouldn't have been under covenant. Um, so, and this is where we understand that when it comes to Holy Communion, if you're not saved, you should not be taking that Holy Communion. Uh, I had gotten into, oh my goodness, it was a grueling weekend. It was a whole weekend I tarried with this pastor who did not understand that they should not be given a child communion, who was not saved, all right? The word of God says, he that eateth unworthily, eat or drinketh damnation unto himself, 
okay? Unworthily does not mean, again, we talked about works. That doesn't mean things you do. It doesn't mean, it means salvation. Unworthily is, is without salvation. That's all it is. So they did not understand that. And I promise you, I was with them all Friday evening, all Saturday, and then Sunday after church until late evening. I was with them trying to ex trying to explain. I mean, it was a long haul trying to explain this, but finally they got it. <laughs> Amen. And this is where it starts. This is not about people. It is not about a caste system. It is not about any of that. It's not about the amount of money. It's not about, okay, a servant can't um, have it, but the, the, the owner can. This is about someone who's not saved. Amen. Those that are not saved should not partake of Holy Communion. Period. It, it's just not anything that can be disputed. Amen. When it's a foreigner and a hired servant shall not eat thereof. A foreigner is someone that is foreign to the kingdom of God. That's a foreigner. We have used these scriptures throughout history to, and I say we, I just mean the world in general, to try to separate races, to try to separate cultures, to try to do that over and over and over again. God did not intend that. I'm sure he looks very, very unkindly on that as well because he created all of us. He did not mean for a caste system to be in place. He did not mean for what we have contrived as races, you know, come up with as a race. He did not mean any of that. He very much wants us all to be together, but we've used a lot of these scriptures for divisiveness. And we've got to, especially in these last days, be very aware of that and don't let that, um, don't fall prey to that foolishness and that trick of the enemy because it that's exactly what it is. It is a trick of the enemy. And don't let the kingdom of hell win any little battles or any little victories. We have to look at these for what they are. We're talking about saved and unsaved. And that's it. Amen. In one house shall it be eaten. You shall not carry forth out of the flesh abroad out of the house, neither shall you break a bone thereof. Because again, we know Christ, Christ said not a bone in his body would be broken and it wasn't. And that's why his bones were not broken when he was put up on the cross. Um, I shared this before that in crucifixion, the legs were broken always because um, the way they had the post for their, their feet up on the cross, they would automatically try to push up in order to breathe. And so his legs were not broken and he was able to push up and breathe, which made the death process even longer. Amen. But he gave up. It was, it was all a matter of just torturing him and trying to humiliate him as much as, as they possibly could. But he gave them everything that, that they did. He, they weren't doing anything. Amen. They thought they were. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. And when a stranger shall sojourn with you and will keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised and then let him come near and keep it. And he shall be as one who is born in the land for no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. So Jews, Gentiles, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Whoever comes to the Lord will be saved. His free will offering of salvation is for everyone who believes to the Jew first and also the Greek. That's what he says. Amen. Anybody. But the uncircumcised person, that person that's not in covenant um, with him, shall not eat it. So that means child, teenager, adult, elderly, whatever it is. If they're not saved, they should not pretend to eat it. Pretend that they are. Amen. We are more, we, we hold more closely vows and covenants made in fraternities and sororities than we do the word of God. If we see somebody who's not in a sorority or a fraternity and they've got on a sweatshirt that's supposed to be that sorority or fraternity, we will have a fit, flip things upside down. But we let anybody eat or drink damnation unto themselves. We got to prioritize and keep the main thing the main thing. Amen. Verse 49, one law shall be to him who is homeborn and another to the stranger who sojourns among you. The Lord does not have two different ways to save, okay? He doesn't. 
There's one way to save and that is it. There's no two ways about it. It says it's not one law for one and another law for another. He has one way to save. Believe in your heart, confess with your mouth and you shall be saved. That's it. It's not by works. You can hand out two tons of food to the homeless. Um, you can go out there and give haircuts. You can do whatever it is you want to do. It is not by works. That's nice that you did it. Rah, rah, hurrah. Good for you. You're not saved. Amen. You're just not. You can serve in every nonprofit there is to serve. Good on you. Great. You use your time wisely, but you're not saved. Amen. Believe in your heart and confess with your mouth and you shall be saved. It's not difficult, but you got to do those two things. Amen. Amen. Thus did all the children of Israel as the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron. So did they. So everybody did it. And 51, and it came to pass the selfsame day that the Lord did bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their armies. Amen. That means they were organized. They were organized. They were ready to go. Amen. And we're going to end there um, for today and pick up next week with chapter 13. Amen. Amen.